I will not accept a life I do not deserve. There is a quote attributed to Irish poet Oscar Wilde that he probably never said, but what are you going to do? It's the internet. There are two tragedies in life. One is not getting what you want, the other is getting it. That is the price of fame, released in Ty West's Mia Goth trilogy, which concludes in 2024 with a 1980s-based Maxine. And while X takes place in the late 1970s and Pearl in 1918, their common theme of seeking validation through fame and notoriety rather than through personal intimacy applies more to younger millennials and Gen Z than it does to the characters of those eras. So before we begin, be a star and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'm about to gouge your eyes out with some spoilers. So if that doesn't interest you, no peeping. First, let's start with a couple of assumptions. One, that Ty West intended X and Pearl to appeal to 20 to 30 year olds, not Generation Jones. Two, accepting that, the protagonists have much more to say about the current state of affairs than the eras in which the films take place. How can you love someone and still be with other people? Third, no generation has more famously gotten the lemon end of the stick and been told to pull themselves up by their own lemonade straps than the cuspers that bridge the millennial and Gen Z generations. <laughs> it is this last element that I want to talk about here, and I want to start by posing a question. For those of you who are under the age of 30 and have watched Pearl, isn't the most uncomfortable moment of horror not the killing of animals, or the maggoty putrescence of a rotting pig, or even the killing of innocent people? Isn't the most horrific moment that you identify with Pearl in that final monologue? Truth is, I'm not really a good person. I'm going to take it for granted that you believe that killing innocent people is wrong, and that you believe cruelty to animals is wrong, and that you should probably bring your gift pig in from the heat, even if you're not going to accept it. But isn't there a part of you deep down that knows exactly what she's talking about when she says that I'm worried there may be something real wrong with me, Mitzi. Seems like there's something missing in me that the rest of the world has. Isn't the horror of Pearl not that she's a monster like Hannibal Lecter or Norman Bates, but that she doesn't feel like a monster at all? Failure. She feels like... you. I've never spoken about it out loud to anyone. So afraid of what people might think. And if that's the case, maybe you're the monster. That is horror on the deepest level. If you feel this way, and Pearl's monologue makes you cringe, not because she feels so alien, but because she feels so familiar, you're not alone. In India, young people touch old people's feet to show reverence. Japan has a national holiday called Karonohi, respect for the aged day. You know the reason why advertisers in this country love the 18 to 34 demographic? Because it's the most gullible. If you're over 30, you probably know Bill Maher as the former host of Politically Incorrect on Comedy Central and later ABC. And for the past 20 years, the host of Real Time with Bill Maher on HBO. His brand of boomer humor is what qualifies as edgy for the set who can't drink milk after 9 p.m. And his political humor mollifies political centrists by making them think that they're engaged in solving the problems of the world through laughter. Your kids will grow up and ask you, what's Facebook and why were you on it all day? <laughs> what's a reality TV star and how did one become president? For those under 30, you probably know Bill Maher as a single recycled joke in a Ted Baker suit. <laughs> and that's just in the monologue. <laughs> Maher has continuously railed against young people since the late 1990s, and he latched onto a pretty sweet grift that has pulled in the right-wing audience that he always lacked by shifting from free-floating anger at the youngs to specific grievances about pink hair and pronouns. And now an emoji for pregnant men. Real. I'm not making it up. For Mar, kids these days aren't just overly sensitive ruiners of comedy whose protests keep him from finding his next girlfriend on a college campus. They're practically a different species unrecognizable to the rational people of the world. Let's get this straight. It's not me who's changed. It's the left, who is now made up of a small contingent who've gone mental and a large contingent who refused to call them out for it. But I will. That's why I'm a hero at Fox these days. Of course, Marr isn't alone in all of this. Media outlets, particularly business journals, have turned the puzzlement over millennials and Gen Z's cultural preferences into a cottage industry of think pieces, hit pieces, and listicles. Why do they hate Applebee's? 
Why do they prefer avocado toast to home ownership? Is she wearing cat ears? Do they realize those screens are preventing them from drinking from the hose? What the hell is Boba? Does Bo Burnham connect to the Wi-Fi? Now every generation is puzzled by the one that comes after it. I mean, with the exception of Gen X. I mean, we're just stuck in a 1980s nostalgia loop and we can't be bothered with any of it. You've got mail. Oh, f yeah, Quisp t-shirt. But not in the cart. Most generations are puzzled by the ones that came after it. But when you add physical markers to identify generational values like unnatural hair colors and gender nonconformity, you start to engage in a process that sociologist Falguni Sheth calls racialization. For Sheth, any characteristic can be racialized if the dominant political group is passionate enough about making the differences matter. It's just that in America, skin pigmentation has been the overriding racial marker of our entire lives. But many people are still alive who witness the racialization of Latinos and Muslims and the deracialization of Irish and Italian people. According to Sheth, it's less about the characteristics of the people involved in the group and more about the challenge to the traditional order that they represent that determines whether the group becomes racialized. Characteristics are just a helpful marker to identify who is and who isn't a member of the racialized group. Maybe most importantly though, Sheth says that racialization isn't a passive or organic process, something that just happens naturally. It's an active process driven by political motivations and power dynamics, a tool of governance that allows those in power to maintain control and order. That a student identified as a cat and wanted a litter box, and the school didn't provide the litter box, so the student went ahead and defecated on the floor. Really. Really. Really? Really. Of course, it's incredibly important not to dilute Sheth's theory by expanding it beyond what it was meant for. So I'm not gonna be saying that boomers, millennials, and Gen Z represent different racial categorizations. What I am saying though, is that Sheth has classified a racialization process that the politically powerful use to identify and marginalize groups of people and that at least some of those practices are being used to take the social, political, and economic power away from younger, undesirable people. Usually by shaming them into giving it up, but sometimes through outright legal and institutional force. Raise the voting age in this country from 18 to 25. And because it's based on characteristics and not culture, it's a problem that can never really be solved. That's why media outlets consistently think of millennials as 21 years old, despite most of them being in their late 30s and early 40s. Lister's got a 401k, just let him have a snack. It's also why young people are both too communist. 36% of millennials think it might be a good idea to try communism. But much of the world did try it. I know millennials think that doesn't count because they weren't alive when it happened. And too consumerist. Lots of talk, and at the end of the day, hopelessly seduced and addicted to pigging out on convenience, luxury, and consumption. Where does all this ungratefulness stem from? How is it you find our life so beneath you? You've always had a roof over your head, food in your belly. Do you not think that came at great sacrifice from your father and I? It's not about individual choices. It's about ensuring that the traditional social, political, and economic order is preserved. Let's say you have a non-standard gender identity. Hey, what the hell are other people supposed to do about that? What are the rules here? And if you represent new and diverse ways of doing things, even if you don't actively advocate for those things, you're still locked out of the club. Since Marr and the rest of the Boomerati portray these generational quirks as personality defects, rather than the logical consequences of the social environment people live in, it's no wonder many millennials and Gen Z feel shame and guilt for not achieving the boomer lifestyle, or even for wanting a different lifestyle altogether. And it's hard not to see this conservative backlash against the more progressive elements of young people as a defense mechanism. A rejection of the ideology means a rejection of them personally. You're not kind of black, so why not preemptively label the rejection itself as a moral failing? <laughs> then what a fine woman you hope to become. Leaving your mother alone to rot so you could dance with a bunch of silly whores. It's significant that Ty West's target audience was the first to be robbed of the American dream and handed a bill for the unprecedented growth and entrenched political corruption of the 20th century. As if that's not enough, Zillennials and Gen Z are still supposed to maintain the Cold War ideologies that never got tossed in the history bin, 
even though the infrastructure and social investments that enabled those individual successes have all dried up. That at least was the point of view of the late cultural theorist Lauren Berlant, who called the spoils of the American dream cruel optimism. For Berlant, the promises of capitalism, the long-term career, the house with the white picket fence, the two-car garage, the 2.3 kids, the dog named Spot, and trips to the Amish country are not just unattainable for most people. The cultural attachment that we maintain to those things in light of that unattainability isn't just frustrating, it's cruel. To quote Berlant, A relation of cruel optimism exists when something you desire is actually an obstacle to your flourishing. It might involve food or a kind of love. It might be a fantasy of the good life or a political project. It might rest on something simpler too, like a new habit that promises to induce in you an improved way of being. These kinds of optimistic relation are not inherently cruel. They become cruel only when the object that draws your attachment actively impedes the aim that brought you to it initially. In other words, when you engage in actions in a pursuit of an objective that will never come, or when it does come, doesn't provide the satisfaction you'd hoped for, the emotional attachment you had that drove you to pursue it is a cruelty. Nobody, Nobody said, said that. You. It wasn't great today, dog. You're not ready for this level. We're trying to find the Are best. Berlant's examples of cruel optimism include staying in a dead-end job because it promises an eventual promotion that shows no real signs of ever coming, clinging to a romantic partner who is unfulfilling or even abusive on the hopes that eventually the relationship will get better, continuing to pursue a career or passion despite repeated rejection or failure, holding on to the idea that hard work and persistence will lead to social mobility, and most importantly for our purposes, Believing the fame and notoriety that comes with social media success can provide genuine connection and fulfillment despite evidence that it often promotes shallow or performative relationships and exacerbates feelings of isolation and inadequacy. I just think I'm gonna have a really big, big, I just think I'm gonna have a really big break from social media for a while because it's really just, I know mentally Instagram for me is a problem. It is through this lens that we can best understand Pearl, the titular character in Ty West's prequel. When we first meet Pearl, she is already living part-time in a fantasy world. Her introductory scene sees her wearing her mother's dress and dancing a sensual ballet in a harsh spotlight. It's telling that Pearl's favorite skill is dance, because dance is simultaneously a form of escape and a form of expression for difficult emotions. According to critical theorist and women's studies scholar Sarah Ahmed, Dance can bring together what is often pulled apart emotion and movement, the individual and the social, the subjective and the objective, the inner and the outer, the bodily and the cultural. Through dance, emotions are given form, shape, and expression. Bodies become conduits for emotions, while also being shaped by cultural meanings and social norms. Pearl's fantasy is shattered by her mother Ruth finding her and scolding her for wasting so much time when she should be doing her chores. This is the first of many arguments between the two, with Pearl expressing a desire to live a carefree life of adoration, and Ruth admonishing her for wasting time that could be used for labor. Pearl is in her late teens or early twenties when we first meet her, and she's already bound by social constraints. She's married, a condition that she doesn't seem very enthusiastic about, as she worries when she thinks she sees her soldier husband coming home from the war, and fantasizes about him blowing up. Her father is an invalid, having fallen victim either to the influenza epidemic of 1918 or possibly polio, and Pearl now has to act as his caregiver. All this in addition to running the farm. Despite her mother's admonitions, Pearl finds joy in her chores, pretending that the barn is her stage and the animals her audience. Pearl doesn't just use this as a form of escapism, it's transgressive. As Ahmed states, Dance can be a form of resistance to norms that discipline the body and emotions. In the act of dancing, we can experience a sense of freedom and possibility that challenges the constraints of dominant culture. This is certainly the case for Pearl, who views dancing and performing as the real her, which only the barn animals can see and appreciate. Y'all see me for who I really am! Her mother, according to Pearl, is too stupid to realize how special she is and what a star she'll be one day. Mama's gonna feel real stupid when she finds out, won't she? This notion, we already suspect and will confirm later, is Pearl's cruel optimism. 
I'm special. The bigger problem is that Curl's transgressions don't end there. As it was with her mother, Pearl's performance in the barn is interrupted by a wayward goose. And it's here, roughly five minutes into the film, where we see just what an astonishingly great performance we're in for from Mia Goth. Much is made about the monologue that closes the movie, and rightly so. Given that it's practically criminal that the Academy ignored such an incredible performance. But while those are moments that actors live for, the smaller, subtler ones are the ones that often go unnoticed. Working on an almost subliminal level to make the audience feel uneasy. In this case, Goth lets the joy of performing melt away, leaving a cold, distant countenance. It would be easy to indicate emotion, and believe me, Goth's face can be plenty expressive. But here she just lets the context of the scene do the work, and her stony expression does the rest. Pearl, we learn, doesn't limit her rebelliousness to dancing. She also kills small animals and feeds them to her gator, Theta. And she has no qualms about bathing in front of her helpless father, there's also a sort of impish unruliness that isn't directly hostile, as when she sneaks off to a movie swigging her father's morphine, rather than rushing it back to him. What took you so long? West wisely never gives us a definitive reason for Pearl's antisocial personality disorder. It's just better when we don't know why the killer kills. But it's also safe to assume that Ruth's oppressive and controlling ways have been present all Pearl's life, and have only gotten worse when Pearl's father fell ill. This is the social problem I mentioned earlier in which a generation of young people has largely been starved for support and affection. It's just dance along. It's selfish is what it is. For Pearl's part, she doesn't appear to have any friends. Her husband is overseas, and her mother is cold and distant. You ate the candy, that was your supper. The food I worked hard to prepare alone is not. Pearl's life has been consumed by the farm. According to criminologist Travis Hirsky, Social isolation and disconnection can weaken the social bonds that we all rely on, making it more likely an individual will engage in deviant behavior. Whether it's a biological problem or a sociological one, we know that Pearl feels strain, and there's an underlying suspicion about herself that she's not dealing with. And why did you just go cold on me? What did you see? She tells the animals that they see her for who she really is. But Ruth later confronts her and tells Pearl that she's aware of the things that Pearl does when she thinks no one is looking and that eventually someone is going to see who she really is. It's only a matter of time before you hurt someone else. Malevolence is festering in you, I see it. This is one of the more fascinating elements about Pearl. Does Ruth's controlling behavior create a monster? Or is her controlling behavior just an attempt to keep the monster at bay? And I will not in good conscience let you leave this farm again. Even Pearl herself isn't much help. She knows that something is wrong with her, and she masks it as best she can. That's why fame is so important to her. It's the ultimate validation. After all, if those people on the tours and at the state fairs and on the stage and in the movies love her, they can't all be wrong, right? That means there's nothing wrong with her. In fact, she's exceptional. She's a star. I'm a, I'm a star. This insight, both from West and Goth, who served as co-writer, is what turns Pearl from a novelty mashup of Douglas Sirk and Psycho into a heartbreaking tragedy. Pearl's breakdown when she's told she didn't get the part isn't just confining her to a life of lackluster normalcy on the farm. It's a rejection of her attempt to prove that she is okay and worthy of being loved. There's a dance audition in town tomorrow. I'm going to it. Why? I'm not if I'm good enough. And if you're a young person who listened to that monologue, particularly if you're a woman, particularly if you're someone who's neurodivergent, particularly if you're someone who doesn't perfectly conform to gender, racial, or class norms, you probably felt yourself getting uncomfortable at just how much you identified with Pearl in that moment. I wanted you to feel jealous. It's an awful feeling like rot the way it just twists and turns at your insides. I feel it. Whenever I see others whose lives come easy. The end of Pearl's monologue represents a prime example of what horror film scholar Barbara Creed calls the monstrous feminine. Which is something that most women can identify with, even if it doesn't directly apply to them. For Creed, women, principally women who don't conform to the norms and expectations of society, become objects of disgust, especially in a male viewer. Drawing from Sigmund Freud, Creed thought that this is largely because women were seen as either domineering mother figures like Ruth, or volatile castrators like Pearl. 
The social implications of this were enormous because they resulted in marginalization, where women who were perceived as monstrous were excluded from mainstream society and seen as abnormal or deviant. Objectification, where non-conforming women were reduced to objects of scorn, almost like insects or vermin. Violence, the emotional and physical abuse heaped upon them, including manipulation and gaslighting. And internalized oppression. This is the harshest one because monstrous women tend to internalize the shame and self-loathing, which colors how they perceive the world. The raven was called sin. Tell me, Mama? Say it. No. The raven was called sin. Ooh, woman. And the raven was called sin. There's a feeling of isolation and that something is fundamentally wrong with them, leading to a decline in mental health and other negative outcomes. Analyzing Pearl through the lens of Creed's monstrous feminine allows us to explore the complex portrayal of the female protagonist and her internal struggles in the film. In Pearl, we witness the transformation of the titular character from a young, dream-filled girl to an adult woman grappling with her desires, frustrations, and a sense of entrapment. All my life I've wanted off this farm and you were my ticket out. Pearl's monologue at the end of the film reveals her innermost thoughts, providing a glimpse into her emotional turmoil and the monstrous aspects that emerge from it. How could I be responsible for another life? Life terrifies me. One aspect that aligns with Creed's theory most is the exploration of the female body as a site of fear and horror. This is why Ruth's disdain at Pearl's indelicacy around her father is so palpable. Pearl's conflicted feelings about her pregnancy and her subsequent relief about the miscarriage highlight a rejection of traditional motherhood and the associated expectations placed upon women. This ambivalence toward motherhood can be seen as a manifestation of the monstrous feminine challenging societal norms that expect nothing less than an enthusiastic embrace of the role of child-bearer and caretaker. Why should we be settled with caring for them or the work of this farm? What about us getting what we want? Pearl's yearning for escape and her fantasies of becoming a chorus girl reflect the theme of the uncanny and the desire for transformation. The discrepancy between her rural farm life and her aspirations fuels her frustrations, contributing to her sense of being trapped and her eventual descent into violence. This blurring of boundaries and the eruption of violence are part and parcel of Creed's monstrous feminine, because they challenge conventional notions of femininity and normalcy. I've seen the things you've done in private, and you believe no one is watching. Pearl's conflicts with her mother Ruth provide insight into the generational dynamics and the ways in which societal constraints are perpetuated. Ruth's dismissal of Pearl's dreams and her insistence on conformity can be seen as a manifestation of the oppressive forces that the monstrous feminine seeks to unravel. This is perhaps better elucidated in X, where Pearl appears as an elderly, decrepit, yet still murderous figure, and we witness the continuation of her monstrous nature. This portrayal emphasizes the persistence of her desires and the lingering effects of her past actions. The usual effects of the aging process are subverted, as Pearl remains a source of terror despite her physical fragility challenging the notion that femininity and aging are synonymous with vulnerability. Of course, in the ensuing 60 years between the events of Pearl and the events of X, there were tectonic shifts in the cultural landscape. The radio and later television connected the country in ways that Pearl couldn't have imagined in 1918. We had a Second World War, and then Korea, and then Vietnam. Had enough farmers trying to shoot me for one lifetime. The Russian Revolution, which would have been largely meaningless to Pearl, had only happened a year earlier, by the time we hit the late 1970s, we're steeped in the Cold War. All this rapid-fire cultural change led to what sociologist and philosopher Zygmunt Bauman called liquid modernity, a social state in which postmodernism has torn down all of the old modernist institutions that failed so many people – religion, school, patriotism, careers, identity groups, and even the traditional family – and it replaced them with hyper-individualism. You're a fucking sick symbol. This hyper-individualism had a number of benefits. If you're racially fluid or gender fluid, you can more easily adopt different roles depending on your social group and face less of a hassle. I realize that less of is doing a lot of work in that sentence, but I'm talking about compared to previous generations, so run with me on this. You aren't expected to work at the old mill all your life anymore. Most Americans will have 12 jobs in their lifetime and only spend about four years at any one position. In fact, statistically speaking, two thirds of you have another tab open right now and you're on ZipRecruiter. Bauman says all this is fantastic for individual freedom. Being able to label yourself how you want, being able to choose your family instead of being shackled together by biology, not having strict rules laid out by a deity, it's a pretty sweet gig. The problem with all of this, according to Bauman, 
is that it comes with a sacrifice. With stable institutions, I know I'm a good salesperson if I sell more stuff than the next guy. I know I'm good at being a man by being more masculine than the next guy. I know I'm better at being a Christian by being more pious. If this all sounds a little judgy, then yeah, that's the point. I need other people who are like me to judge where I am socially, and how I'm doing at being a member of my identity group. Even if I don't measure up to them. I mean, I may not be Cary Grant, but there's some utility in knowing that I'm Ralph Bellamy. At least I'm in the movie. Sure. <laughs> I don't get it. This judgment is what psychologist Leon Festinger called social comparison. You probably don't know the name Leon Festinger, but I'm willing to bet you've misused his most famous work. Festinger is the man who coined the term cognitive dissonance to refer to the discomfort an individual feels when holding inconsistent or contradictory beliefs. One of the ways to reduce this dissonance is by looking at what other people in your social group are doing and finding similar behaviors and beliefs. If they're doing it, you know that you're probably okay. But if you don't have a stable social group because identity groups have become fluid and amorphous, you lack a valuable way to orient yourself and ways to form trusting and intimate relationships. And when that happens, many people turn from a few stable relationships to dozens, if not hundreds of shallow ones. And that is the point of Pearl and X. One day the whole world's gonna know my name. I want the whole world to know my name. Bauman believed that rapid advances in technology, including social media, helped exacerbate the dissolution of traditional institutions, and that technology would also lead to a desire for instant gratification, shallower and more disposable relationships, and a fear of being vulnerable. All things that are necessary for building intimate relationships. So if you're the child of someone who came of age when irony poisoning was running rampant and the only reality you've ever known has been digital and streamed to your device, it's no wonder that you have difficulty both giving and receiving intimacy. And when people are starved of intimacy, they'll often seek love from strangers, conflating followers with family and clout with compassion. And that's where the lead characters Pearl and Maxine have so much crossover. I want what they have so badly. To be perfect. To be loved from as many people as possible to make up for all my time spent suffering. If Pearl is about cruel optimisms, then X is about a squandered life of regret. Like Pearl, Maxine is played by Mia Goth, and, like Pearl, when we first meet her, Maxine is staring in a mirror. The most glaring difference, though, is that Maxine actually has a significant other who is not only present, but he is wildly supportive of her. You're special. I'm special. There ain't nobody else out there like you. But we already have plenty of gals like you in the troop. Hey, everyone with a pulse is gonna lust after a piece of Maxine Minx once they see what you can do, because you got that X Factor. We're looking for something different today. Someone with X Factor. In fact, Maxine has an entire friend group that is collected around the porno film that they're making. Maxine's desire for sex and stardom isn't met with ridicule and scorn, it's the reason her friends bond with her. I just want a paper house and a big old pool so I can float around with my knees in the breeze and tan these titties. None of this is to say that Maxine hasn't felt rejection. There's a running motif throughout the film with the televangelist railing against the perversions of the then-modern era, including filthy sex, perversion, and probably chewing bubblegum in class. As the film closes, it's revealed that the evangelist is actually Maxine's father and that she ran away from home. Or in his words, she was lured by the deviants into a life of sin. This is a reveal that, in the context of X alone, doesn't mean very much. We already know that Maxine is a wannabe porn star from the outset, and the why and wherefore don't really factor into the conflict between her and Pearl. I saw what you did in the barn. Deviant little whore. It's not until we have Ruth, acting like a revealer on top of an image, that the evangelist's true purpose is revealed. Both Maxine's father and Ruth preach about the old ways of doing things. Ruth with her Protestant work ethic and the evangelist with his Protestant everything else. We never actually see the televangelist interact with Maxine, but we can't imagine what the conversation would go like, given who she is and his system of beliefs. I'm a fucking star! The whole world is gonna know my name! The, the, whole world is gonna know my name! the difference though is that Maxine actually did leave the home life that was so oppressing to her. Like Pearl, she views herself as a star who was meant for something far greater. But unlike Pearl, she didn't make a deal with her husband to stay at the farm and conform. We can love each other. I'll do that for you. If you really meant all that, till death do us part. The call to Maxine and Pearl is what I call the millennial monomyth. A hero's journey in which an ordinary, and even oppressed, person will be revealed to be special all along. 
usually by some mentor, and then they will solve the problems of the world. Of course, it rarely works out that way in real life, leading to a lot of disappointment. Both women instead represent Creed's monstrous feminine, but Maxine embraces it, relishing in her desires, while Pearl shrinks from them in shame. For Maxine, repulsing the squares isn't a bug, it's a feature. Ain't nobody ever teach you not to stare? It's rude. This kind of feminist narrative is increasingly popular since the dawn of second wave feminism, and has positively exploded in the fourth wave. Most of these women were at least partially positioned as villains, or at best, women whose power needed to be restrained by men or government or some other social constraint. And that's Pearl's tragedy. Ruth spent her entire run in the movie shaming Pearl, not for failure or for quitting, but for the pursuit itself. Pearl was told that the thing she wanted most in the world, the thing that would have given her validation that she was normal and loved, was frivolous and immoral. Ruth tells her how disappointing she is and how she frolics while her father's health deteriorates and the farm goes to pot. It's this shame that ultimately pushes Pearl to give up on her dream and become a psychotic trad wife after one rejection from a small-time troupe she didn't even know existed a few days earlier. Compare this with Maxine, who clearly had a falling out with her evangelical father and peaced out rather than give up on her dreams of being a star. I will not accept a life I do not deserve. And it's why Maxine both fascinates and inspires hatred in Pearl, and why it's so important that Mia Goth plays both roles. In retrospect, it's fairly surface-level analysis to say that Pearl hates Maxine for triggering in her the self-loathing she feels for giving up on her dreams, and the jealousy she feels that Maxine has her entire life ahead of her, while Pearl's is a life unexamined. Living life on our own terms, and never accepting what self-righteous naysayers have to say. Take it from me. Letting outdated traditions control how you live your life will get you nowhere. Ich kann dir nicht erlauben, dein Leben zu verträumen und dich vor deinen Verantwortungen zu drücken. Es ist ein Zeichen von Schwäche. But that's only in hindsight. We don't really get that X is Pearl story too until we get the context of the backstory in Pearl. All I really want is to be loved. No. Please. You know I can. My heart. None of this is to say that Maxine isn't her own character and worthy of study. In fact, her embrace of the monstrous feminine is exactly what fuels X and makes it something more than just navel-gazing pastiche. Like Pearl, though, one has to situate the film in its historical context, which the film does through its aesthetics. If Pearl is a Wizard of Oz by way of Douglas Sirk melodrama with bright, saturated colors, X pays homage to the burgeoning slashers and grindhouse films of the 60s and 70s. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre color palette and Easy Rider transitions of X remind us that the sexual revolution is still fresh, and that cultural mores underwent a radical shift. Maxine and friends are all on the same page where pornography, sex, and intimacy are concerned. Everybody likes sex. Queer, straight, black, white. <laughs> it's all disco. You know why? Because one day, we're gonna be too old to fuck. Even Jenna Ortega's Lorraine comes around once their ethos is explained to her. I want to do a scene in the movie. It's a far cry from the conservative landscape that Pearl grew up in. In fact, it's almost as if the projectionist took over the world to conform it to his bohemian tastes. Pictures like this are going to revolutionize the industry, and I, for one, plan on capitalizing early. This new home video market is set to explode. Finally, people are going to get to see what they desire in the privacy of their own home. These motifs are what separate the film from your typical slasher flicks. This is evident when the gang explains to Lorraine that sex and intimacy can be separated. Besides, it's just sex. You can decide who you want to love, but not who you want to screw. Attraction is out of our control. This is an idea that comes straight out of the sexual revolution of the 1970s, and would have been familiar to bohemian hippies, yet still radical to older people and those raised in conservative households. These ideas are laid out in sociologist Anthony Giddens' book, The Transformation of Intimacy, Sexuality, Love, and Eroticism in Modern Society. Giddens argues that traditional forms of intimacy were based on distinct gender roles and institutional arrangements that govern social life. How they can expect a woman to still have any mystery left for a man after living in a place like this for three days, I don't know. Darling, you don't need mystery. You've got something much better, something more alluring. What? Me. But the rise of modernity created a more egalitarian form of intimacy, based on personal choice, not social expectations. You don't have to get me drunk to take advantage of me. Of course, none of these changes took place in a vacuum. The sexual revolution was made possible by the rise of the welfare state in America and the rapid advancements in safe, reliable birth control 
including the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision in 1973. Without the constraints of being tied to men economically or through reproduction, women had significantly more freedom to choose their relationships based on individualization, reflexivity, and risk. This acknowledgement that sex could be for pleasure's sake instead of procreation led to an increase in acceptance of queer sexualities and identities, and a renewed interest in romantic love as the primary form of intimacy, rather than practical love. The easiest way to see this is not through the female characters, though, is through the men and their reaction to sexuality. In Pearl, the projectionist describes himself as a bohemian, someone who is socially unconventional, generally transient, and rarely tied to any sort of conformity. This is the exact type of freedom that Pearl desires, and why he fascinates her so. What would you like to see? Palace Follies. Oh, come on, you saw that already. In her monologue, Pearl tells Howard that she saw him as her ticket off the farm, and she was frustrated and heartbroken when he said that he wanted to stay rather than take her away. Pearl misreads the projectionist's intentions, though, thinking that his advice to her to find freedom in Europe is an invitation, when of course the last thing a bohemian would want is to be tied down with her traditional romantic relationship. But it's the constrained sexual mores of the past that actually wind up getting him killed. If Pearl's freedom were not dependent on a man or on the dance troupe audition, their sex could have been casual, as he assumed it was. Instead, in a sequence that harkens back to the Telltale Heart, the projectionist hears Ruth knocking from the basement where Pearl has left her to die. And when Pearl tries to stop him from investigating, he hits her with an inadvertent gut punch. What's the matter with you? Nothing. It's his lack of recognition that sex meant more to Pearl than it did to him, not just emotionally, but in terms of her freedom, that leads to his demise. I'm not staying on this farm! While the projectionist is the only real male character of note in Pearl, masculinity is more broadly varied in X. You sure? Flat feet. I did. Two tours in South Vietnam. And the men deal with the sexual revolution in vastly different ways. Wayne, of course, embraces it wholeheartedly. We do even half the numbers that Debbie does Dallas, and I'm out of the red for good. Like the projectionist, he thinks that opening the floodgates of sex and perversion will be to his financial benefit which is not exactly the progressive mindset it might seem like. I hate to be the one to tell you this, but ain't none of them nice girls. This is a difficult line to parse because it's dripping with so many different meanings. On the one hand, it does represent Wayne's cynical exploitation of sexual freedom and his attitude towards his own girlfriend, something that belies his usual homespun discount McConaughey charm. The flip side, though, is that he's arguing against RJ's insistence that Lorraine is not like the other girls, that she's special and more innocent. This attitude is the other side of the coin from the nice guy syndrome that pervades a lot of male thought to this day. When did you become such a brood? That women with a quote-unquote high body count are less valuable as people. That women who enjoy sex have to have mental problems or daddy issues. Or that women should only enjoy sex with their partners and have no desire, curiosity, or fondness for any sex that they had prior to meeting them. This would have been a natural outgrowth in response to the sexual revolution from male peers at the time. Sure, free love is theoretically good, but in practice it hurts men's insecurities. And at least Wayne has a realistic, if shallow, recognition of women's sexual freedom. Now, if she's serious, well, she's gonna do it whether you like it or not. RJ, on the other hand, has that I'm a feminist if it'll get me laid attitude that allows him to feign progressive politics up to the point where a woman's desires clash with his. None of this is to say that RJ isn't entitled to boundaries or to feel hurt by the way things went down with Lorraine. But he was such a condescending prick to her about sexual mores that the audience isn't exactly on his side on this one. Not real life, Rainy. It's just a movie. I know that. But the joke is that while RJ is overtly libertine and covertly a prude, Pearl is outwardly judgmental and inwardly a freak. It's almost as if there's nothing separating everyone's desires in these movies, except for the social constraints left on them by culture and environment. And that's part of Ty West's point here. The thing that you're denied is the thing that motivates you the most. Why won't you look at me? And absent a way to get the thing that will fulfill you, you either search for substitutes like Maxine, or let it corrupt you like Pearl. This is a lesson we can take from the moralization of American youth. And it helps explain why many people wind up chasing shallow adoration rather than something more fulfilling. Whether this is a theme that will continue in Maxine remains to be seen. But the first two-thirds of West's trilogy explore the consequences of generational rejection 
in ways that we're simultaneously repulsed by, curious about, and maybe even a little sympathetic to. And that's Pearl and X, two films that, intentionally or otherwise, have a lot to say about the gaping cultural hole left in an entire micro-generation, and their futile attempts to fill that hole in one of the few ways that they have left open to them. Thanks for watching! Be sure to subscribe and comment, stay cool, wash your hands, make good choices, return your shopping carts, and I will see you next time.